Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. I would like to welcome you all to the launch for the book Prescribed Burning in Australasia, The Science, Practice and Politics of Burning the Bush. For those that don't know me, I'm Deb Sparks from the Centre of Excellence for Prescribed Burning. To begin today, particularly during Reconciliation Week, I would like to acknowledge our original fire practitioners, the traditional owners of the land that we all stand on today. Here in Melbourne, that is the Wurundjeri Nation and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I would like to acknowledge special guest watching, including members of the Centre's advisory group, past members of the National Burning Project Steering Committee, authors, photographers and other contributors to the book. The, this magnificent photo behind me is from the front cover of the book and was taken at Mount Solitary by uh, Professor Ross Bradstock. Before I introduce our guests, I'll just let you know that we will be sharing details of how to purchase the book later in the webinar. We have a fantastic lineup today for you with Emeritus Professor Steve Dobers and Professor Sarah Legg giving some insights from their chapters and some comments from the lead editor, Adam Leavesley. However, to begin proceedings, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Shane Fitz, the newly appointed Commissioner of Resilience New South Wales. Shane will be familiar to most as the face of the past Black Summer Fires, whereas Commissioner of New South Wales Rural Fire Service, his leadership and compassion was shown daily on the news feeds here and around the world. We are very honoured to have him here today to launch the book. And thank you, Shane. No problem at all. So good morning, everybody, and thank you, thank you for the opportunity uh, to join today. Uh, this is this is a special occasion. Uh, the full title of the new book is "Prescribed Burning in Australasia: The Science, Practice, and Policy of Burning the Bush." We all know that prescribed burning uh, is an absolutely essential part of bushfire mitigation across Australian landscapes. Uh, to reduce risk to communities and ecosystems. And it is the most effective approach to treating bushfire risk and maintaining ecosystem health across, across large areas of land, large areas uh, of, the, of the landscape. Uh, prescribed burning uh, is, is complex. Uh, it is not risk-free and it involves complex planning that has to consider a diverse range of perspectives as well as emerging science and practical knowledge. And, and with increasing changes to demography and movements. Uh, there's, there's a lot involved in planning and executing prescribed burning. The book broadens the discussion away from just hazard reduction burning uh, and appropriately considers cultural, ecological uh, and economical objectives to burning. The book is unique as it gives a voice to, to agency uh, and practitioner knowledge and perspectives, as well as work from, from academia uh, uh, and science. Uh, the book is designed to increase the understanding of, of value of prescribed burning in, in land management, which is important, uh, and, and the extraordinary work through the book. And I, I did get a copy last night. Uh, fantastic. Uh, the book, um, uh, 50 authors, uh, which, is, which is extraordinary, and photographers have contributed to the content of the book. Um, the work of the editors in compiling the book uh, can only be commended. Uh, it shows a, a genuine and sincere passion uh, for the important subject uh, and its importance more particularly um, to the people across, across Australia and our landscapes. It is my duty and indeed my privilege today to formally announce uh, that the book is now available to the public uh, and is highly recommended uh, to anyone interested in the complexity of the arguments and the challenges surrounding prescribed burning. The book's available at the AFAC online shop and I would encourage everybody uh, to get a copy, uh, have, a, have a read of the book and um, um, get a gr greater appreciation of the challenges, of the complexities and the importance associated with, with prescribed burning throughout Australasia. Thank you very much and congratulations to all. Thank you for your investment. Thank you for your commitment uh, and thank you for sharing. Thank you very much, Shane. They were very kind words indeed. And yes, the book does cover a range of topics. Um, to present on one of those topics now is um, 
Emeritus Professor Steve Dovers from the Plenar School of Environment and Society at Australian National University, where he was director of the school from 2009 to 2017. And he works with the ANU Disaster Risk Science Institute. He is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, a bushfire and natural hazards CRC researcher, and a senior associate, associate with the firm AFA. Steve is going to talk about some of the concepts from his chapters, focusing on prescribed burning in a policy and political landscape. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks very much, Deb, and, and thank you, Shane. Um, I'll, I'll actually start with a bit of a reflection on those years as director of the Fenner School, where I'd, I got a lot of feedback uh, from outside reacting to the published research of my academic staff. And these communications, which sometimes you could call missiles or grenades, covered all sorts of issues, uh, ranging from urban development, of water allocation, how we spent international aid, climate change and fire management. And I have to say, they're all very contested issues with a lot of deeply held beliefs, uh, vested interests, but compared to other issues, the emails and letters I received about fire management were the most passionate, sometimes inflammatory, and fire management seems to generate a particular intensity of opinion. It's the hottest of hot topics. And I don't think it's just different interpretations of the science. There's something about fire and especially prescribed burning that um, really does lead to quite bitter debates at times. Now, fire is just one of the many land management tools that our agencies use. And usually those sort of management tools are implemented regularly under policy frameworks and they don't become perennial political issues. But some do, and prescribed burning and feral horse control and others really never go away as arguments. And we do get simple arguments about prescribed burning. It's, it's just either fuel reduction or the environment, and it's always pretty much only about public land. So the two extremes, on one hand, say it's a silver bullet, there should be more of it, and then big fires won't happen. On the other hand, an extreme says that it's ineffective and we shouldn't do it. I got a lot of feedback from both the extremes, but strangely, not much from people in the middle. And that's where this book comes in, I think. And when big fires are on, we do have populist politicians and commentators blaming someone else, either to gain advantage or get hits on their blog or divert attention. And I think this book swerves from those extremes because there are so many other issues involved and Shane mentioned some. The extreme arguments tend to ignore things like it's aesthetic appeal of settlements, housing affordability, impacts on tourism, the health impacts, access and egress for suppression, land use planning, other ways of reducing fuels, firefighter safety, all sorts of other issues. So prescribed burning is an important part of this policy picture, but it's one part and it's wrapped up with a lot of other things. And what we invest in one thing always means less for something else. And really, it should be an argument about getting the most risk reduction for the dollar uh, around those trade-offs. So there's a lot more complexity to this than the extreme arguments would have it. Of course, you know, if we had an endless supply of productive land and natural environments, no climate change, a compliant population that did everything they were told, no existing fire-prone assets and a bottomless bucket of money, everyone could be kept happy and that would be lovely that public policy is about complex problems, trade-offs and multiple values. And that makes it political. So fire management is political, but it could be constructively political, not a slanging match. So that's where I thought the idea of this book was a very good thing, to have thoughtful, diverse perspectives. And I'd recommend people read the chapters that they might not agree with or are unfamiliar with before they read the ones they know they agree with. I'd like to just touch on two things I, I touch on in the book, which I think give a lens to prescribe burning that I've been involved in. One was a review through the CRC that I undertook with colleagues looking at the recommendations of post-incident inquiries to see what was across all those inquiries. Now, there were a staggering 142 inquiries post-incidents between 2009 and 2017. So the emergency services and fire services are very well scrutinized. We always seek to learn after events. We analyzed 1,300 recommendations and the bulk of them, the vast bulk, concerned the operations of the agencies. 
Next came land use planning, but that was almost all from one flood inquiry. And in the middle, there were issues that got a modest amount of attention and one was prescribed burning. But like with planning, most of it came from just one inquiry. I was surprised there wasn't more focus in those inquiries on prescribed burning, given the arguments we have about it. And maybe the inquiries did not encounter it as a problematic issue. But what gets more interesting, I think, is what the inquiries barely mention. Um, individual and household responsibility, private land, uh, the private sector, even volunteers, all big parts of the management picture, fire management picture. It's supposed to be about shared responsibility. But from what our inquiries say, uh, that's not really the case. So should we rely on prescribed burning to do all the heavy lifting for risk reduction? Should we apply that lots of burning takes the burden off planners and householders, communities, firms, and other state agencies? I think the answer to that is a very clear no. The second process I refer to in the book comes from participating in the review of Victoria's bushfire management programs a few years ago. We looked at the implementations of recommendations 56 to 59 of the Royal Commission, which were about prescribed burning. And again, only on public land. We judge Victoria's management regime as needing further work, but groundbreaking and world's leading practice. Now, I'm from New South Wales, so this is very hard to get these words out, but take a bow, Victoria. The Victorian program had a number of elements to it, and some were, I think, easier than others to implement. The first recommendation was to burn 5% of the landscape, public land estate, each year. And given the resources and weather permitting, that can be done. But it also demanded an evidence-based, risk-based approach to that burning. And that was harder, but we judged that that was being done well. Monitoring the effectiveness of those burns was harder again, but good work was being done. I think where it got most difficult had to do with people and ecology. Community engagement was core to the program and core to the recommendations. But as anyone will tell you, sustained community engagement is very difficult. The hardest, of, to my mind, was how prescribed burning affected what was termed ecological integrity and factoring that into the fire regime in an evidence fashion. And that's where, to me, our data modelling capacity and monitoring systems in many parts of the country need a fair bit of attention. And apart from commending the book uh, and, and the publisher and the editors, that's a good point for me to hand over to Sarah Legg on the environmental aspects of fire. Uh, thank you all. Thanks, Steve. Um, I did find your chapter quite illuminating on the interplay of the role of different institutions, and it's um, really interesting to hear it, to, you talking about the different levels of community responsibility as well. Turning now from policy to ecology, I'd like to introduce Professor Sarah Legg from the University of Queensland and the Australian National University. She's a Deputy Director of the Threatened Species Recovery Hub of the National Environmental Science Program, Deputy Chair of the Threatened Species Scientific Committee, and a member of the Australian Government's Expert Panel for Wildlife and Threatened Species Bushfire Recovery. Sarah is going to um, talk a little bit now about the consideration of biodiversity during prescribed burning. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Deb, and uh, I'm really delighted to have the chance to help launch this fantastic book. Um, now, I'm going to share my screen because I wanted to show you a few slides, um, partly to break things up, but also most of the pictures in these slides are, are from the book itself. So let's see how we go. How's that working? All good? Great. Um, okay, so this book's a, a tour de force, really. It's, um, let me just give you this. Got an amazing number of authors, um, covers lots of different material, uh, including some insights to the history of prescribed burning in Australia, which I find particularly interesting. And it showcases a range of different uses of prescribed burning and how they, these, um, these uses play out in different biomes. 
And I think it does a really fantastic job of capturing the diversity of opinions and approaches uh, when it comes to prescribed burning. And why is there so much diversity over this issue? And I, I think one of the key reasons, obviously, is because there are multiple objectives to prescribed burning. And that's really one of the key messages of this book. And these objectives, and there's some examples of um, common objectives up there on the slide, they don't overlap perfectly. And the book encapsulates a lot of those tensions. Um, but that doesn't mean that the objectives are always at odds. So North Australian fire management is a great example of finding a sweet spot where prescribed burning does actually deliver on multiple objectives. So in the north, the enabler for large scale prescribed burning programs has been emissions abatement. So basically a carbon economy. And this map shows you where all the currently registered Savannah burning projects are across the north. But although the enabler is economic, the outcomes from prescribed burning are much more diverse than just emissions abatement. They include benefits to pastoral production. Uh, assets like fences and other infrastructure don't get damaged as, as much. There's more grass left for cows through the year. There's benefits to cultural maintenance and livelihoods and benefits to biodiversity. Although the evidence for this is a little bit patchier and I'll come back to that in a tick. Now, I'm not saying that all of these objectives are achieved perfectly all of the time, but the projects across Northern Australia are aiming for that sweet spot between the objectives. And I think, you know, over time, projects will be constantly adjusted and outcomes will improve across the board. And there are some excellent chapters in the book that describe some of the benefits from these Northern Australian programs. So I mentioned that the evidence for biodiversity benefits from prescribed burning, at, at least in the tropical savannas, is a bit patchy. And that's partly, I think, because fire is now interacting with novel threats. So cats are a great example of this. Um, they've only been in Australia since European colonisation. And we now know that cats are attracted to hunt in open areas, including recently burnt areas, as you can see from this map. So I'll see if I can use the cursor. So these yellow dots here are GPS locations for a cat living in the normal part of its home range. And whilst the cat was collared, there was an intense fire down here. You can see that brown area. And the cat would make several journeys over the next couple of months to this fire scar and spend time hunting in there. It's easier to find animals to, to, um, to hunt and catch. So in this case, fires, particularly intense fires, are amplifying the predation pressure from feral cats, which is a novel threat. And similarly, livestock are now interacting with fire management. So if, if you put in a prescribed burn and there's livestock within reach of that prescribed burn, they'll flock to it and eat the regenerating grass, removing all the cover that native wildlife need and allowing cats to go to town on any animals that are living in that area. So basically, if you have stock living in an area that you're, um, where you're managing fire using prescribed burning, the stock are likely to neutralize the benefits of your prescribed burns. So the point I'm trying to make here is that fire management can't be addressed in isolation of other factors. And prescri prescribed burning needs to be integrated with monitoring and constantly adapted as information comes in. And this is a point that's very well made by Alan York in one of the final chapters of the book. So let's teleport now from the tropics down to the temperate forests because it would be a bit weird not to talk about the 2019-20 bushfires when launching a book about prescribed burning. Um, so, you know, as everyone knows, the fires covered an enormous area, um, some of it with this quite astonishing intensity, uh, and killed vast numbers of animals. And I think there's no other single event that's caused such a massive sudden biodiversity loss in our lifetime, certainly terrestrial biodiversity loss. So as well as the immediate carnage of all those deaths to animals, um, hundreds of species have been brought closer to extinction. And these are really a species that with a really wide range of uh, ecologies and, and uh, natural histories, uh, species with small and large ranges. So as you can see, for example, on this map, the Mount Capita rock skink here lives just on the rocky outcrops near the top of Mount Capita, so a very small distribution. Most of that was burnt in the bushfires. And you can contrast that with something, an animal like the yellow-bellied glider, which has a really big distribution here in pink, 
but unfortunately it overlaps very neatly with a lot of the bushfire affected areas from last season. Some species are definitely extinct as a result of these fires. So to give you one example of a species that we think has gone, the Banksia montana mealybug, this is it here, little cutie full of uh, character and charisma. Um, this mealybug lived on just one plant species, the Banksia montana, which itself had a very small distribution in the sterling ranges of WA. So the entire range of the plant and the mealybug has been burnt and that mealybug's probably gone. We think that dozens to hundreds of invertebrate species could be extinct as a result of the fires and most of them are gone before taxonomists have even had a chance to put a name to them. So as part of the Australian government's expert panel for bushfire recovery, um, some colleagues and I did a lot of work to try to identify the species that were most heavily impacted by the fire so that recovery investment could be directed to those species. And we found that emergency recovery actions are needed, and will be needed for some time for literally hundreds of animal and plant species if we want to prevent extinction and support recovery. So almost 200 invertebrates, almost 500 plant species, and almost 100 invertebrates. These are very big numbers. So in the aftermath of that disaster, we have to ask some very hard questions, hard questions to answer. Um, questions like, did prescribed burning before the bushfires help save some, any populations? And how can we use prescribed burning to reduce the scale and the impact of future fires especially as the frequency of extreme fire events uh, increases. Can we use prescribed burning to reduce the risk of wildfire events, extreme wildfire events, in a way that itself doesn't also damage biodiversity? These are hard questions and science are gonna, is going to be critical for answering them, especially as our baselines are shifting all around us and will keep shifting for some time. So we really need to hold on to the principles of evidence-based management to limit biodiversity loss in the next few decades. And it's worth noting that one third of the book is devoted to evidence-led management. So there's a danger in events like the recent bushfire disaster that people will start to think of fire as an enemy. Um, and as horrific as that event has been, and obviously we never want to see it again, also we probably will, um, we still need to try and embrace the complexity of fire because Fire is part of Australia's ecology and part of our culture. And I think the song uh, shared by Den Barber in the book, in one of the chapters of the book, really exemplifies this beautifully. And I've put just an ex excerpt from the full song up here. And I think it really shows the interconnectedness of, of fire and life in Australia. And, you know, we also need to remember that fire gives us opportunities to connect community and people with country. Uh, and those opportunities are still rich and plenty in Northern Australia and in the deserts. Admittedly, it's more challenging to realize those opportunities in temperate Australia, but just maybe one of the few good things that could come out of the recent bush, bushfire disaster uh, could be to facilitate a deeper relationship to fire and country for more of us. And again, that theme of human relationships with fire comes through in several chapters of the book. So I'll stop there, uh, but I'd just like to congratulate the editors and all the authors for producing a really interesting and valuable book. And I hope everyone enjoys reading it as much as I did. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, just uh, close your eyes. Yeah, I've got it. Got so, it. Um, yeah, I sometimes think we can forget about the ecological need for good fire management in the debate around hazard reduction burning in the more densely populated areas of southern Australia. So that was a really um, great talk to sort of raise some awareness there. Our final speaker today is uh, Dr. Adam Leesley from ACT Parks and Conservation Service. Adam is speaking on behalf of all the editors. That's himself, Mike Wowdis from the South Australia Department of Environment and Water, and Dr. Richard Thornton, the CEO of Bushfire and Natural Hazard CRC. Adam was the lead editor for this book and his tireless commitment to liaising with the authors, 
curating photos and working with the copy and design was sometimes a thankless task. But it's my pleasure today to rectify that and thank him publicly for his dedication to making this book possible. So thank you, Adam, and over to you. Thanks, Deb. Uh, thanks to all, to uh, Shane, um, Steve and Sarah for your kind comments today about our book. On behalf of the other two editors, uh, Mike Wowders and Richard Thornton, um, yes, thank, thanks very much. And I also need to talk to, to mention Deb Sparks, who's very ably managed uh, the project. The original idea of this book was that we would um, review the science. And, and what I mean by that is the technical knowledge about the fire behaviour, fuels and ecology that's needed to run the kind of sophisticated burning programs which the community expects of us. And you'll find this in part two. But we thought we needed to do more. And one of the key things that's come out of the bushfire CRCs in the past decade is that people are central, are central to bushfire management and especially to prescribed burning programs. So part one is about the social context of prescribed burning and, and the social license that fire managers need to deliver our programs. Then in part three, we've asked a collection of experts, fire scientists, practitioners, ecologists, to respond to a set of questions which we hope will allow readers to compare and to try to find the common ground. We hope this will help to form the foundation for a society in the future which is more at ease with prescribed burning and less fearful of bushfires. So as we've heard, our book brings together the work of more than 50 authors, all of whom are experts and, and leaders in the field. But there's another 50 contributors as well um, that I, I must mention, and they are the photographers. The pictures aren't decorative, they're part of a story and the photographers are equally as important contributors as the authors. So I want to thank everybody who contributed to the book. It's been a great pleasure to work, to work with you all and um, yep, we, hope, we hope that we've made a difference in, um, in, in bringing Australia to, to a position where, where we're more able to deal with bushfires in the future. Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Adam. Now, for all the people that are watching, I shall bring up all the um, panellists at once. Uh, as I say, um, that concludes our um, book launch today. Um, for those that are keen to purchase the book, the link was put up in the Q&A box, but also you can just go to www.afac.com.au and you can click the shop link in the top right of the web page there. So once again, I'd like to think, thank our special guests today, Commissioner Shane Fitzsimmons, Emeritus Professor Steve Dovers, Professor Sarah Legg, and Dr. Adam Leesley. And thank you for your time and attendance this morning. And um, I hope you enjoy reading the book. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.